Hello students, this part of the lecture is a continuation of chapter 10 and today's lecture I will be focusing on the different types of inheritance that are involved in the inheritance of body traits. Um, if you can, please download and print out the next two slides for uh, note recording and it looks like this. Um, if you haven't going to be having any trouble printing this out, then uh, please use the format, especially the section headings to guide the note taking process for yourself and use the questions that are there to guide you to record some of the key concepts that I would like you to be able to walk away with. All right, so up to this point, um, we have talked about Gregor Mendel's work. And the main focus of the last lecture was on the pea plants that he had studied. Now, if you recall, all of the pea plant traits, all seven of them have very clear, uh, strong contrasting traits. Either they are dominant um, or they are recessive. And they are typically coded by two alleles. However, if you look around your environment, um, and even if you look in a mirror on yourself, you may notice that not all of the human traits and traits of other plants and organisms um, or, uh, have such strong contrast where they're either one or the other. Take body height, for instance. Um, you will notice that we're not all either tall or short, and, in, and the same applies for skin complexion as well. There's actually a continuous range that uh, you can actually very quickly um, bring out. So are our traits really governed by just dominant and recessive traits? Obviously, the answer is not. If you take a look at the snapdragon flowers that is in front of you on this slide, you may notice that the snapdragon flowers come in a variety of colors. As a matter of fact, for the snapdragon flowers, the red color is a dominant trait, whereas the white color is a recessive trait. And the offsprings that when you cross these two plants together, they will actually produce the pink color that we see in oftentimes in the uh, bouquet flowers that are comprised of snapdragons. So what exactly is this? This is a type of inheritance known as incomplete dominance, also known as blended inheritance. This is where the phenotype of the parent's generation um, gets combined and the offspring, it's a blend between the two. Now, typically we could record the genotypes for each of the parents using capital letter R, capital R, to represent the red color snapdragons, and R prime, R prime, to represent the white color in this particular snapdragon. You may sometimes notice that on the internet, and likewise in some of the biology textbooks, they would denote with the letter C. Um, and then up above it, uh, they would indicate um, with the letter R, um, in either capital or lowercase letters. These different forms of notation could vary. However, the concept is the same, is that the resulting F1 generation or the offspring that is produced from these two parents that have homozygous, uh, do, uh, homozygous traits, they will result in an intermediate pigmentation that you will see that is quite different from either one of the two parents. Now, if we take a look at the resulting offspring, we know from the previous slide that all of them would result in a pink color, uh, which is essentially going to be um, uh, a heterozygous trait. However, if you were to take each one of these two heterozygous offspring and you get it to self-pollinate or to cross-pollinate, um, they will wound up having a th a, a revealing the three different colors that a representative of all of both of the pre of the both of the generations, you can result having one quarter of them being big R, big R, and the one half of them would be heterozygous, big R, little r, and then one quarter of them would be little r, little r. But if you were to take the hybrid and you cross pollinate it with the homozygous recessive one, which is the white color one in this case, half of them would result in pink color and the other half would result would would result in white. So far, Mendel's work has revealed that strong phenotypic um, contrast can result from monogenic traits, meaning traits that are determined by either dominant or recessive alleles, like the capital usage of the capital um, uh, A versus the recessive A alleles. However, you and I know that not all traits are like that. So how do we explain the wide variations in body frame, also known as body structure, hair color, distribution of fat throughout the body, and skin color that we observe in ourselves and in other organisms? 
That's because uh, body traits are not always coded by two different alleles. Sometimes there could be more than two alleles that codes for one particular trait. Take chinchilla fur color as an example. Some of you may actually have one of these animals at your own home and you know how adorable they can be. They're super cute. So it turns out the fur color in chinchilla is coded by four different alleles. Um, we designate them as capital C, capital C with the superscript of CH that represents chinchilla. And uh, then there is also the capital letter C followed by the H, the notation of the H, which represents the Himalayan allele and the recessive C. Depending upon the, which combination of these four alleles, the phenotype, meaning the fur color of the chinchilla, would come in a wide variety, just like the way you would see on this particular slide in the, image, in the actual photograph here. But here's something that's very interesting before I show you the, what each one of the combinations would result in. It turns out the dominant C allele is incompletely dominant over the Himalayan allele. And it is also dominant over the albino alleles. However, the Himalayan allele is dominant over the re albino allele, which is the recessive C. Now, so there's a bit of a hierarchy that we're looking at between these four different alleles. And depending upon what combination we get, you will have a chinchilla that has a different fur color, which is quite interesting. We call this allelic series or hierarchy. And you typically would find them based on the different combination of genes in the offspring. So let's like look at a real life example. So here are the four different alleles that I mentioned earlier. The dominant C, the C with the chinchilla allele, and C with the Himalayan allele, and the recessive C. If, an, if a chinchilla inherits a homozygous dominant pair of alleles, which is what we call the wild type, the normal type, what we typically find, your chinchilla will wound up being a brown fur color. But if your chinchilla inherited two copies of the chinchilla allele, which is incompletely, which is incompletely dominant by, by the, uh, if you inherited one of the C instead, um, the resulting offspring would have a black tip white fur color, as you see in this particular schematic diagram. But if your chinchilla inherited um, the two copies of the Himalayan allele, well, then your chinchilla will have white fur with black paws, the nose, ears, and tails would be all in that characteristic pattern. Now, what's interesting about the Himalayan allele is that this particular phenotype is a result that would produce temperature-sensitive gene product that only produces pigment in cooler extremities of the rabbit's body. So in this particular case, you see these pigmentation being deposited is because of this temperature sensitivity um, of the gene. And we will come back to this particular concept later in the lecture. Now, as for the last combination, the, if uh, your chinchilla inherited two recessive C alleles, then it will become all white, also known as albino. And in this particular case, it will be all of one color, which is in strong contrast to the wild type. All right. Now, what about human blood type? How do you explain that one? Now, this is one of the part of the lectures that I would really like you to give it a little bit of a thought and try some things out in between. So let's begin. Um, as you already know, the human blood type, we have four of them. There's type A, type B, type AB, and type O. It turns out there are four different alleles that can be called, there are three different alleles, I misspoke. There were three different alleles that can code for this blood type. And depending upon the combination of which two of these three, it will result in a different blood type, as you'll see. So if you didn't know, if we let capital letter I represent the dominant allele, which represents I stands for immunoglobulin trait, which is the dominant trait, and the lowercase i represents a recessive trait, well then, knowing that we have both blood type A and blood type B, in humans, how do we denote that? It turns out this is how we distinguish it. We will write down capital letter I, followed by a superscript of the letter A, that denotes an allele that's gonna call for blood type A. This, even though, now don't be confused, even though there are two alphabets being used there, we're really just talking about one allele. This represents the gene that we inherited from just one parent, either from the mother or the father's side. And then 
for blood type B, we would denote it as capital letter I uh, with the superscript of a letter B that represents another one of the alleles from one of the parents. But then the lowercase i with recessive would represent the allele that codes for the recessive blood type, which is type O. Now, keep in mind that for every single body trait we have, it is coded by a minimum of two alleles. So how would you write the genotypes for the four different human blood types? So if you take a look at this, here is the answer. For blood type A, an individual could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Now, if you take a look at this, this particular author chose to write it in a recessive eye. I like to write it as a dominant eye to represent that it, it's more dominant in the presence of a recessive allele. All right, so we capital I raised to the A and capital I raised to the A, which represents that this particular individual offspring received two copies of the letter I raised to the A, one from each parent. And this individual also known to have blood type A, but it is really just coded by having one dominant A allele, but the person actually has a recessive I allele. Now, this is one of the reasons why I don't particularly like writing it this way. I like it right with capital letter I to denote that whenever I have that copy of the allele, it would mask the, um, exp it would mask the, the um, expression of the recessive allele. So that, now some people would write it like this, all right, where they write down the letter O for represent allele. You can ch choose whichever method works better for you when you are taking a test if the work doesn't have to be represented. But if the work has to be shown, then make sure you denote like the way I did before, where you clearly indicate what does each of the alphabet represents. Now, carrying on, blood type B, this individual can also be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant, in which case, if it's homozygous dominant, it's capital I raised to the B, capital I raised to the B, or capital I raised to the B followed by a recessive I. In neither way, because there is the inheritance of at least one dominant allele, which is designated by the capital A or capital B in this particular case, then you know that blood type will be expressed. But what about blood type AB? Well, it turns out this is the example of codominance, where neither one of these two alleles can cover the expression of the other one. So both of them would appear on the phenotype of the red blood cell. So this individual inherited one uh, capital I raised to the A and capital I raised to the B. And then for blood type O, the individual must have inherited two recessive I, all right, such that it would result in this expression. How can we take what we have just learned, which is the coding of this genotype, which results in this expression in phenotype, how, does that, how do you explain it in terms of what really happens in real life? Let's take one step forward. Now I'm gonna give you an example of it. So far, we have indicated that for an individual who has blood type A, there are two ways of getting it. The same is true for B, but there's only one way to get blood type AB and one way to get blood type O. How, what does this translate into in real life? Let's take a look. I'm using this simple diagram to represent a red blood cell. This particular person has blood type A and has a receptor site that has this particular square shape. Now, can you tell me, based on your background knowledge, if somebody has blood type A, what kind of blo possible blood transfusion can they receive? If you are thinking about blood type A again, you are correct. But many of you also know that blood type O also makes sense. You're right if you're thinking along these lines. So the answer for this particular box right here would be blood type A and blood type O. So how does this individual who has blood type A block blood type B from entering its body cells? And if it does, how can it clot it? Hmm. So here's a little hint for you. This is a type of plasma protein that an individual who has blood type A would be producing to ensure that if but blood type B ever enters its body, it would be able to coagulate it so that it would clot it. 
So what would then, if you know that this is the answer for blood type A and this is what the plasma protein might look like, so what do you think the receptor site or the, for blood type B would look like? And what kind of plasma protein would blood type B individuals be producing? Well, what about the type of blood transfusion that blood type B can accept without injuring itself? What blood type can it not accept? In which case, what should the shape of this plasma protein be? Now, what about for people who have blood type AB? Remember, blood type AB is an example of codominance, meaning that both of these alleles will be expressed. Now, I already gave you the answer for blood type A. So if an individual with blood type A, they would have this particular receptor. So then what would this red blood cell receptor show? What would that look like? Now, if you're thinking that half of the part of the cell receptor should look like that, you are correct. But then what would the other half of the receptor sites look like? Remember, they both show up, they both express. And for individuals who are blood type AB, what type of blood transfusions can they receive? Many of you know the answer for this one, that it would be blood type A, blood type B, blood type AB, and blood type O. They are known as the universal recipients. So if they can accept all of these blood types, what type of plasma proteins would they be producing? Would they be producing them? Think about it for a moment. And what about individuals who are blood type O? They actually inherited two recessive copies of this gene. So what would their receptor sites look like? What type of blood transfusions can they receive? Can they receive blood type A, blood type B, or blood type AB? Or can they only receive blood type O? If you're thinking that they can only receive blood type O, well, then you are correct. But then, what kind of plasma proteins would they be making such that they would block off the other blood types from circulating in their body? Hmm. Okay, would they be known as a universal blood donor or universal blood recipient then? Now, here is a harder question for you to think about. After when you are completely done answering and drawing all of these pictures for me and completely filling out all of these boxes, if a doctor has to donate blood from blood type A into an individual with blood type AB, which, which part of this person's blood would you be putting into blood type AB's body? Would you put both the red blood cells and the plasma protein? Would you only put the plasma protein? Or would you only put the red blood cells? Now, you should answer this question after you are done completing this diagram. So when I check your lecture note sheets this week, this is what I'm going to be looking for. And what I want you to do is to write down on the bottom for me during blood transfusions, if what the person needs are red blood cells, what portion of this whole blood that is circulating in this person's bloodstream would you actually inject into your patient that has blood type AB? Think about that for a moment. And if you're planning to inject blood type O individual's blood into blood type AB patient, which portion of his or her blood would you put in here and why? If you look at these diagrams carefully, that should give you a sense as to how this whole process works. And if you're thinking, well, don't we use different parts of the blood um, for blood donation? You are right. It also depends on the circumstance. However, if the person needs red blood cells, then why would you only put some part of it and maybe not the other? I hope you could see it more clearly now that you have a schematic diagram in front of you. So I look forward to seeing your answers for these two questions that I have. Okay, so now your textbook gave you a diagram like this, which should help you um, develop some sense 
of what the answer should be on this part of my worksheet but they drew it quite differently from what I did. So that's why I wanted to challenge you to see if you could figure it out. All right, now, here's something very interesting about pregnancy and blood types. Many of you are aware that we don't just have blood type A, blood type B, blood type AB, and blood type O. For each one of these four blood types, there's also something known as an RH factor. For example, we know that we could be A positive, A negative, O positive, O negative. Those positive and negative signs actually refers to the rhesus factor, also known as RH factor, that comes with denoting the type of blood that you're carrying. Now, here's what's interesting. Supposedly a man who is RH positive for his blood type, and the woman that he decides to have a child with has an RH negative blood type, positive, for RH factor, it's dominant over recessive. So the baby that they conceive will be RH positive. Here's what's interesting, is that during the first pregnancy, when the baby is developing inside the mother's body, the mother will detect, would the, her white blood cells would be able to detect that there is a difference between these two blood types, that hers is negative, hers is, and, and this child's is positive. The white blood cells inside her body over time will develop antibodies against this RH factor. Why? Because some portions of these uh, RH factors would be detected and be seen as a foreign antigen that the woman's body would want to fight off. Now, lucky enough, in many instances, if this is the first time this is happening where the RH factor in the baby is different from the mother's, it takes a long time for the woman to build up the antibodies before it can circulate or enter um, and pass through the placenta where it can injure the child. And so what happens is after when the child was born and she and him conceives a second child, because of the increased amount of antibodies that are already circulating in her body and is on alert, her antibodies can actually cross the placenta and attack the child, which can lead to a miscarriage. Now, sometimes kids can also, this can actually happen even on the first round of pregnancy. Sometimes you don't have to wait for the second one. So what can doctors do if that were to happen? And you want to prevent this from happening ever again. Um, one of the things that doctors would do is they would prescribe immunosuppressants to the pregnant woman, such that um, we would reduce the amount of antibodies that her white blood cells would be producing so that the baby can develop and become stronger before you would take her off of the immunosuppressant. But of course, if you are going to be given, uh, giving the pregnant woman the immunosuppressant, her immune system would have a hard time fighting off any types of infections or potential infections. So in which case, she would have to be extra cautious with um, the environment that uh, she is living in and that she's working in. So now, here is another diagram that can uh, give you a glimpse if you're having trouble seeing it from the previous diagram in terms of how this actually works. Okay, here's a video that um, I have found from the Amoeba Sisters that I thought it was pretty good in terms of helping you understand uh, how multiple of these work. If you want to, you could choose to review it um, at your own discretion, uh, but this is an optional video for you to decide whether you want to use it or not, or whether you feel uh, there's a need. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. So how was Mendel's concept of inheritance verified? Remember, it was in the 1800s that Mendel had postulated that how all of this could be used to explain the observations that he had made in the pea plants in terms of pea plant height, flower color, seed pot texture, seed pot shape, all of the above, right? And he came up with three different laws. He called them the law of segregation, law of independent assortment, and law of dominance. So each one of these that he had postulated, he did not actually see 
where the genes are located. As a matter of fact, the terminology that he used was uh, that, that these were known as units, that there were some units or factors that were being passed along from the parents uh, to the offspring, and that some of these factors or, fa or, or units are more dominant than other ones. But where do you find the proof? Well, it actually took many, many years to pass before scientists recognized the significance of Mendel's early work. Um, and then the harder part was finding the evidence to support his concepts that he, to, ex to explain the observations that he has made. So it wasn't until the early 1900s that the work of Walter Sutton and Theodore Bovary that came into play. Um, Walter Sutton studied grasshoppers, and through his work, he discovered that chromosomes actually occur in homologous pairs. Re remember that maternal and, pater uh, and paternal chromosomes line up, meaning the homologous chromosome pairs line up during meiosis, uh, specifically during prophase one, uh, during a process known as synapsis. And he explained uh, essentially how chromosomes are the genetic basis of inheritance, and he published two papers in 1902 and 1903. The other work that was also that further helped support Mendel's work, because these are two gentlemen who did their work independently uh, from each other, uh, Bovary actually studied sea urchins, and he discovered that all of the chromosomes had to be present during the embryonic development in order for, for an offspring to develop normally. Combined, both of, combining both of their work, the theory actually helps to explain the mechanism that underlie Mendel's law of dominance, law of inheritance, and law of independent assortment. Um, they also help to identify that uh, chromosomes are actually um, occurred in pairs, which is required in Mendel's law. And the theory also states that chromosomes are linear structures with genes located on specific sites, which are called loci um, along them. Um, here, there's a video from, that is produced by the Khan Academy that I thought was um, quite good in terms of explaining the early works produced by these two gentlemen, which helps to show you the connection between Mendel's work and also Bovary Sutton's work, all right? Now, so what about sex link traits? How about these other traits that are related to one gender, to one sex versus the other one? Well, if that's what you're interested in, then we got to take a look at Thomas Hunt Morgan's work. His work actually led him to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1933. Um, this is actually a famous photograph that was taken in his laboratory uh, at Columbia University. Uh, where he had many, many different jars of uh, fruit flies that he was working with. Morgan's work is really significant because he demonstrated that genes, which are the units that Mendel had talked about in his own publications, are carried on chromosomes, which Sutton and Bovary had mentioned in their theory. So essentially, Morgan further affirmed the work that was uh, proposed and verified by Sutton and Bovary independently. All right, so Morgan's work further ex helped to explain the mechanical basis of inheritance and how it all happens. And his work actually formed the basis of modern science in genetics. Um, this is a very, very famous scientist whose work not only earned him his own Nobel Prize, but the biology, but a division of the biology genetics department that he later formed um, in Caltech um, led to the work of seven more Nobel laureates. Uh, some of his, um, some of the students, the graduate students who wound up work in his, working in his laboratory, you will actually get to hear more about later on, um, uh, such as um, uh, Beto Tatum's work, uh, and also many others as well. So if you want, take a look at uh, some of the um, uh, biological, uh, bibli uh, bibliographical references about his, his uh, scientific discoveries. So for now, let's take a look at this, all right? He worked specifically with fruit flies. And uh, the name of this fruit fly, the scientific name, is called Drosophila melanogaster. Now, these fruit flies are very interesting, in part because they're really small, as you can see from the previous photograph. You can keep many, many of them within a jar, and that can save you a lot of space because laboratory space is always a commodity. And they don't live that long, which means you could have many different generations of them 
uh, being bred inside your laboratory in a confined space, uh, their chromosomes tend to be really large and such that it makes it much easier for you to track and follow what happens during these um, fertilization processes, all right? Here are a few more interesting facts about these fruit flies, is that the normal color for these fruit flies, also known as the wild type, it's actually red eye color. Now, here's again something about notation that I want to bring to your attention. You will find that in some of the, um, when you do a Google search, some of the websites would use the plus sign to denote the wild type. But in some other authorship, uh, you will find that the use of a capital letter W to denote the dominance of this red eye color. In either case, they are synonymous. So uh, the important thing is the consistency in the way in which you use some of these symbols. So the red eye color, according to Morgan, what he observed is a dominant trait. And he, but he later discovered that there is a recessive mutation to this allele that actually can lead to a white eye color. So he denoted that with the, with the lowercase w or just the regular w. Now, what he did was that he crossed a red eye female, which is the wild type, with a white eye male, all right? And the resulting offspring, all of them came out to having red eye. And this is consistent with what Mendel has already observed in his principles of dominance, is that um, this shows that the red eye color, um, even knowing that there is a mixture in terms of the wild type and the recessive type, that all of the resulting offspring exhibited the red eye color allele. Now, the interesting part is how do you explain what comes afterwards? Morgan went on to do another experiment. Now, based on what you have learned about Mendelian inheritance principles, what do you think will happen in the next generation if you were to mate a female red eye fruit fly with a male white eye fruit fly? Think about that for a moment. When you're thinking about this, there is one thing that I want you to consider. How would you write the genotype for each of these organisms if you didn't know that the eye color is related to sex chromosomes? Or pretend that you didn't know that these eye colors are sex linked, meaning that these genes are located on the sex chromosome, specifically on the X chromosome for a moment. Now, if you did that, <laughs> oops, sorry, there's a little typo here, it should be a W-H-I-T-E. If you did it properly, you may figure out that you would write something like this. You would use capital W, capital W represent one of the eye, red eye colors and lowercase w, lowercase w to represent the white eye color. If Gregor Mendel's inheritance genetics was what you had fun following, then you would expect this outcome where all of the offsprings would be heterozygous dominant, meaning, meaning that they should all have red eye color. However, it turns out that was not what Morgan observed. When he crossed the red eye male with the white eyed female, what he found out was this. Two of them, half of them, which are all the females, had red eye color. But then the other half, which are the males, they all had white eye. And of course, he did this experiment multiple times to double check his own work. Each and every time this happened, it never came close to this result where you would expect all of them to have red eye. But how can that make sense when you are anticipating, based on Mendelian genetic calculations, that the red trait is dominant over white eye trait. How is it possible that you wound up with some of them having white eye and that they all happen to be males? How would you prove that your idea is right? So this is how Morgan handled it. Morgan postulated that the gene for the eye color was actually located not on autosomes, meaning regular body chromosomes, but instead on the sex chromosome, specifically on the X chromosome. Why? Because you can see that the X chromosome is a lot bigger than the Y chromosome. And that if you make that assumption, then you would denote that genotype a little bit differently. Instead of denoting just the red eye color with the capital W, you would put that W right next to the X chromosome, 
which is why he superscript this one. And he denote that this is the male. So we write down X, Y and denote it with a capital, with the W, capital W, and that the female, which is XX, each one of them would carry the recessive allele, which is the lowercase w, lowercase w. And if you use that and applied it using the Punnett square, you will see that the female gametes, which has to be the same, X raised to the recessive W allele, but the, but the male could be different. One of them would be X raised to the dominant W, which is a capital W, and the Y, which does not carry the gene for eye color, would be left as is. And if you follow that and you complete the Punnett square, you will see that even though all of the females had red eye color trait, they are all heterozygous. And then for the male, you can tell that they are all going to be receiving the white eye color allele because the only way for them to be a male is if they get the Y allele from the father, from the male fly, and the other one must be coming from the female. So therefore, all of the female offsprings would end up having red eye color, but even though they're heterozygous, and all the males would result having white eye colors because their eye color is dependent upon the female fruit fly, which is their mother, and the only way for them to be male is for getting it from the father, which is the male fruit fly. Now, this explanation shows that in this case, gender and eye color traits are linked. They are not sorted independently from each other, which is a different type of inheritance that Mendel did not describe in his work. And that is where the discovery lies. Here is a video from Khan Academy that is pretty well made uh, that I would encourage you to take a look at for review and to uh, try to understand this a little bit more at your own pace and at your own time. All right. So, sex link, sex link traits. Well, how is sex chromosome determined? Here is just a reviewing slide for you. Um, here is an older slide that I've shown you previously. Here is the X chromosome. Notice how much bigger it is compared to the Y chromosome. It carries a lot more genes um, in it. In this case, the eye color in the fruit fly is determined on the X chromosome, and it turns out color vision in humans also happens to be found on the X chromosome as well and not on the Y chromosome. All right, um, if you had trouble understanding the previous slide regarding um, the experiment using the uh, male, the original first experiment that Morgan did where he crossed the male red-eye fruit fly with the uh, female red-eye fruit fly who were heterozygous, then this is the resulting uh, result that you can get. This is another way in which white eye color flies can result in males. Okay. So if some of our body traits are linked to sex chromosomes, are there other factors that can affect the expression of other body traits? Well, yes, there is. So I have mentioned earlier in this lecture uh, using the word known as monogenic traits, which are the traits that Mendel had described, right? Where you have a very simple contrast in trait, or where, is one, where there is only two alleles, uh, one is dominant, the other one is recessive, uh, in which case you could only have a phenotypic result of either one or the other. However, because some traits can be determined by multiple alleles, and depending on what combination you get, that is what we call polygenic traits. Um, and what they, can, what they would result in a population, in a large population, is a continuation of and a continuous variation of traits where you can have um, many different traits that will show up. Like for instance, body height, all right? Here's an example. Um, this is a, a, really, a, a really good slide that helps to explain um, skin tone coloration. How is it possible for each one of us to have many different skin tones? Well, it turns out uh, skin color, it's coded by three different pairs of alleles. And depending upon the combination for these three pairs, meaning how many of the dominant alleles, how many combinations of the recessive alleles that you get, you are wound up with a different skin color. Interesting, isn't it? Which is why if you look at, and if you think about any one of your classmates and friends and family members at home, no two individuals would exactly have the exact same color tone to be exactly identical. It, there, there may be a few that you can find, but there's a wide contrast 
especially if you think about people who are not biologically related to each other. It is fascinating. And of course, you already know that there's a benefit to variations in color tone, because in some of these instances, the increased production of melanin, which, are, which is what gives the skin color, uh, the pigmentation, can actually provide uh, varying degrees of protection against UV light. So what about the concept known as pleiotrophy? Well, what that refers to is that there are single genes that can have multiple effects on phenotype. So when you have, depending upon the inheritance of what you get from this gene from your parents, that can actually lead to the expression of many differences, differences in different body traits throughout your body that are coded by this one gene. Examples of this includes phenoketonuria, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and albinism, all of which I will give you some examples to practice with um, in our practicing session. Well, what about our surrounding environment? Can that affect gene expression? It turns out the yes answer is yes. That certainly can happen. Let's take a look at this example, the effect of temperature on turtle sex determination. When a turtle egg is formed and is being incubated, for the first 28 days, the formation of the gonads are pretty much the same across all the eggs. However, between days 28 to day 52, um, there is either an expression or repression of a really important gene known as the SOX9 gene. The SOX9 gene is actually uh, going to deter, it's a, it's a transcription factor that can change its expression level depending upon temperature differences. So if you were to incubate the turtle egg at tw around 25 degrees Celsius, all of these turtles will wound up being born as a male. They form one set of gonad. But then if you raise the temperature of these eggs up to 30 degrees Celsius, which is much higher, then they will all be born into a female. Now that response to temperature change, mainly it happens between day 28 to day 52, not before and not after. Isn't that interesting? This time period is what we call the thermosensitive period, TSP. Now, if you recall in a much earlier uh, part of the lecture where I showed you about the chinchillas, the chinchillas that inherit the two copies or even if they have a single copy of the Himalayan gene or the Himalayan leo, they also are temperature sensitive, which is why you will notice that on their nose, on their mouth, on their edges of their paws, they have patches of darker pigmentation because it's a response of those alleles towards temperature changes in their environment. Just like you see in this particular slide for the sex determination in turtles. I hope that you can take a look at this particular video. Now, this particular video is really important because here what they go on to explain is that for any given pairs of genes that we inherit, sometimes there is another pair of gene outside that is not exactly determining the, the skin tone color or the body height that you have, but they can actually moderate how much of that gene gets expressed either by suppressing the transcription factors or increasing the expression of those transcription factors such that you will wound up with one type of phenotype over the other. Watch this video carefully if you need to play it at a slower um, pace so that you can get a better understanding. Now, this is one of those videos, it's in the last part of your notes, that I will be looking more closely into how you explain what genetic epistatus is. It is very interesting. It is also what allows each one of us to look very differently from each other. And in some instances, perhaps may have an impact on human behavior as well. Okay, here is another video that I have also found that you can use for review at your own discretion, um, uh, produced by the Amoeba Sisters, where it goes over the different types of inheritance that I had mentioned before. Um, and this, also, this one is also really good. However, I really want you to focus on genetic epistasis explanation based on the previous video uh, that I had shared with you. But maybe the Amoeba Sister one would also be helpful. 
Okay, that's the end of my lecture today. I hope that you have found this to be interesting. Take care, and I look forward to listening and hearing from you sometime next week. Take care. Bye-bye.